صلى الله عليك يا سيدي يا مولاي وابن مولاي يا ابا الحبيب يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا بارك الجاه يا قريب يا مظلوم كربنا ما سادنا فما استجاب ودعني نعم النجاة اليك مسادك يا ليتها يا ليتها كلامنا فنكون والله قال الله العظيم في مقسم كتابه الكريم ولقد الحق ولا استقر قائم اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Amongst the most commonly discussed notions in many academic circles is the concept of pluralism. This particular question in regards to what is pluralism and what is the Islamic position on pluralism has become a seemingly hot topic in our communities and it oftentimes deemed as something extremely controversial. Thus, for our discussion tonight, inshallah, we will discuss the different definitions of the term pluralism see what is the Islamic position of pluralism, what does the Holy Quran and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala state about this concept, and what is the position of the Imams, the Holy Prophet, and the Imams of the Ahl Bayt, alayhi wa salatu wa salam. We go ahead and we see that this concept of pluralism, number one, has several different definitions. And each and every one of these explanations for this particular term, needs to be discussed, needs to be understood, and then we need to conclude the discussion of that particular definition with a determination of whether or not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His religion, the Holy Prophet, the Ahl Bayt, accept this definition as a part of the religion of Islam. So let us go ahead and take a look at these four or five definitions, depending on how much time that we have tonight, and let us try to understand this concept in regards to the question of pluralism. Number one, we see that there is a notion in the social sciences known as social pluralism. What is social pluralism? We come and we see that those who support this theory of social pluralism, they come forth and they say that this world is a global village. That due to the internet, due to society, due to the way that we live our lives, it's very important for every individual to live peacefully and coexist with one another, regardless of where you come from, regardless of what language you speak, regardless of what type of food you like to eat, and so on and so forth. And when we go ahead and try to understand this concept, we see that it actually has a very strong foundation within Islamic teaching. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for instance, says, Ya ayyuhal nas, inna khalaqnaakum min dhakarin wa umfa, وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلًا لِتَعَرَفُوا That we've created you into men and women. We've placed you into nations and into tribes. And the purpose for us and this diversity in terms of your creation is so that one by one you get to لِتَعَرَفُوا So that you come to know and learn about one another. Thus we come forth and we see that this particular concept of social pluralism is accepted in the religion of Islam. We see, for instance, the government established by the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam in the Holy Prophet.
in the holy city of Medina embraces this concept. Yesterday, in our examination of the history of Kufa, we mentioned that the city of Kufa was a city which was very, very diverse. This immigration would come from different parts of the world. Many of them, they came just to live next to Imam Ali, Ali Salaam. Yet we see that in those four years and nine months of the government of Imam Ali, Ali Salaam, Salaam, we find people who speak different languages. We find people who have different interests. We have people who eat different types of food. We have people who wear different types of clothing. Yet we see that none of these particular ideologies, none of these particular concepts, contradict in the least bit with the teachings of the religion of Islam. Rather, difference is that which has to be embraced according to the religion. The fact that we can always come over here in the majlis of Imam and say, Ali Salatu was Salam, dressed a different way. We might speak different languages at home. We might eat, eat different types of food. We might come from a different culture and so on and so forth. We might desire to raise our children differently. But that doesn't hinder us from progressing as a community who desire to come over here and pray and fast and break our fast and eat together and try for Imam and say, Ali Salatu was Salam. In fact, we come and we see that today, in these days of Azar and Imam and Hussein, everyone of a different culture, of a different background, of a different language, we find in reality that they commemorate the martyrdom of Imam Hussein, Ali Salatu was Salam, very differently, with different languages, by different customs, by different cultures, by different styles of poetry, by different styles of matzah, and all of these types of things. And in fact, we find that in the religion of Islam, we embrace this particular concept. And even for those who don't hold the same religious belief that we do, we find this concept of social pluralism applies. So even if someone is not a Shia, a Nahashari Muslim, believing in the 12 Imams of the Ahmed Bayt, doesn't mean we can't live with them. Doesn't mean we can't work with them. Doesn't mean we can't, doesn't mean we can't live in a society that is dominated by them. Rather, we have to understand that it has to be a mutual respect, a social respect. That's the term, again, social pluralism. Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Adhafar, Ali Salatu wa Salam, he says in that famous slide, that Nasu, from far, Amma Akhwan Laka, the Deen of Nabi Raka, the type, the surely, the people are of two types. The first type of people are your brothers in religion, and the second type are your equals in humanity. Just because you don't accept the same ideology that they do, that doesn't mean you can't necessarily live with one another. Let's be glad that we see that the first definition or the first type of pluralism that is often discussed in these academic circles is this concept of social pluralism. That which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by virtue of the ayat of the Quran and that which the prophetic practices and the sunnah of the ayat of the Amin Bayt also apply and also be accepted. First, we take this particular definition or this particular aspect of pluralism and we keep it the same. Secondly, we have a concept of pluralism known as religious pluralism. And this is the focal point of our discussion today. We see that the discussion of religious pluralism itself is broken down into many different sub definitions or sub -types. And for this, we want to go ahead and take a look at them understand them and see if they fit into the mold of the teachings of the whole of Quran and the teachings of the prophetic person. We see number one, we have a definition of religious pluralism that comes forth and states that every single religion is a demonstration of truth. Every single religion takes you closer toward your goal, which is to gain in knowledge in Ma'raza and to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They that you can come forth and choose any religion as you please. You can choose to become a Muslim, you can choose to become a Shiki, you can choose, choose to become a Sikh. You can choose to become a Christian or a Jew or a Hindu or a Buddhist. It doesn't matter what you desire to come, because each and every one of these paths are a means to take you towards the truth. They all take you towards the goal of getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And oftentimes these philosophers, they come forth and they provide this example. They state that the differences between religions, even though they may be contradictory, is what is known as positive difference. What is positive difference? Philosophers, they come and they define the term positive difference, and they state it like this. They state that today I go to a particular restaurant, and I want to go and eat some ice cream. One individual, he likes vanilla. One individual likes chocolate. 
One individual likes strawberry. One individual likes the mix. One individual likes, you know, I don't know what. The statue, I don't know. Right? They come forth and they see that there's several different choices of ice cream. I might prefer to eat vanilla ice cream, and you might prefer to eat strawberry. Does it mean, or can I come forth and state that you're wrong because of your choice? No. We'll state that, you know what? You have a choice of strawberry because you like it more than vanilla, and you have a right to do that. Well, I prefer vanilla over strawberry, and I, that is my right. Doesn't mean that I'm better than you. Doesn't mean that I have a greater, uh, you know, understanding of ice cream than you do, right? Secondly, you come and you see, for instance, if someone goes to the department store and they go to purchase cologne, perfume, and they go and they see that there's five, seven different choices. One desires to purchase Chanel, the other one desires to purchase, you know, um, I don't know what. This one desires to purchase, yes. And every one of these different options, they're there to choose from. Whichever one that I choose, it's fine. And the one that you choose is fine for you. It doesn't mean that I am, a, you know, that my choice of perfume is the dominant one, and I need to dominate that particular scent over your desirable scent. Rather, we have what is known as a concept of positive difference. That though we have a selection of different choices to choose from, every one of them has their positive. These are all very, very good. This is all wonderful. Composer, we try to apply this particular theory toward the religion of Islam or toward the world religion. We see that one individual chooses the religion of Islam according to the belief of this uh, ideology. One states that I am a Muslim because the religion of Islam it works for me. Another one comes forth and says that I am a Christian because Christianity works for me. Another one says that I am a Jew. Because I subscribe and I prefer to subscribe to Jewish theology. And these individuals who support this theory that every religion is a means to take us toward the truth, they're all right, and everything is okay, and they're still fine. But on the surface, it might sound something extremely attractive. But when we come forth to a belief that we say, oh, so if I am a Shia Muslim, and I support that the fact that the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, he appoints Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhi salatu wa salam, as a successor, while a Sunni Muslim suggests that Abu Bakr is a successor to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, and we're both on the right, and we're both taken to the same truth, and everything is all one. But even though I might believe that the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that there's only one Lord, while another uh, you know, religion, another theology might come forth and state that I also believe in a God, that I believe in the fact that a God can take several different physical forms, that this is also acceptable. Even the fact that they might come forth and that these different ideologies and perspectives contradict one another, we individual state that there's no problem with each and every one of them. Thank you for This state number one, as you mentioned, they contradict one another. If a religion, an ideology, a viewpoint contradicts with one another, how can we both state that they're equally on the same path to it? Logically, the human being, in a discussion using logical deductions and principles, immediately would reject the fact, you know, that you have two that take you toward the path. Meaning that I come forth and I say, oftentimes we ask our kids this, or we ask, you know, our friends this, we say, what is your favorite flavor of ice cream? I have two favorites, no bother. What's your favorite flavor of ice cream? If it's vanilla or it's plum, I have two favorites. Does it work? No, you have to have one favorite. One meaning that is the ideal one, the one that you would always choose. You know, when you have a different, you know, combination of different perfumes, cologne, you have to choose one that you prefer the most. Not the two that you choose the most. Not, 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 the, not the two that you like the most. Rather, you add your opposed question, which one do you prefer the most? Similarly, not every one of them can necessarily be on the same path towards truth, equally perfect, well, they have complete contradictions. These individuals who continue to support this theory in light of the contradictions, they come forth and they conduct this verse of the Holy Quran. And bear with me in this discussion today, as we'll be quoting a lot of ayat of the Holy Quran, trying to reflect upon. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in chapter 2, verse 62. Please follow the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna 
والذين هادوا والنصارى والصادقين من آمن بالله واليوم الآخر وعمل صالحا فلهم أجرهم عند ربهم ولا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون. It's important to say that in chapter 2 of the Holy Quran, verse 62, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, As for those Jews, and as for those Christians, and as for those Saviors, and as for those of different religions, those who believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they believe in the last day, they are protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa la hawfun alayhim, wa la hum yaqsim. And for them, there is nothing for them to fear, and for them, they have no reason to believe. These individuals who support this particular idea that every single religion is pluralistic, that every single religion has the means or the potential to take you towards the same absolute truth, they say, look at the verse of the Holy Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that for every one of these people individuals, there's no reason for them to fear, there's no reason for them to worry. They have a place with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the God. We can put them in the spot that we spoke at the point. An ayah of the Holy Quran without looking at the ayah that surrounds it. Number two, oftentimes people they like to support one verse of the Quran while leaving a second verse of the Quran. Third thing we come forth and we see that if those individuals came forth and they reflected on the ayah and the ayah of the other day, I think that was not the Quran. In regards to the ayah of the Holy Quran, perhaps they have to take this plain verse to clarify some of these matters. This denomination states that one day St. Mahan and Muhammad, he comes to where the Rasulullah and Muhammad, the Allah alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, St. Mahan and Muhammad, he comes from Persia. He comes from a strong, long lineage of the last years. He comes to where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa and he says, Oh, Rasulullah, come and tell me, advise me. What is going to happen to my forefathers? Are they okay? They passed away on a religion and they were not exposed to what you owe us. The Holy Prophet gives this verse of the revelation as if to say, Oh, Sultan, the only life. But those who follow the religion of the past, those who follow the prophets of their time, and those who follow the Sharia of their prophets, those who follow the Quran, and those who follow the Quran, and those who follow the Quran, and those who followed Isa, and those who followed Nuh, and so on and so forth, that they subscribe to a that religion, and if they subscribe to a that theology, and if they subscribe to a that jurisprudence, then for them they don't have to worry about a thing that they were following the prophets that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, wala hawfun alayhim, wala hum yaqsim. And for them there is no worry, and for them there is no need to be. Let's be comforted to take this particular aspect, or this particular definition, of pluralism is applied by some people that state that every single religion takes you toward an absolute truth in spite of the fact that they contradict and they state that within the teachings of the Holy Quran and within the teachings of the other faith, we necessarily don't support this particular viewpoint. In regards to a third definition, we mentioned the first term is social pluralism. The second type is one aspect of religious pluralism that states that every single religion takes you towards absolute truth. Thirdly, we have a third type of definition for, for pluralism. This particular theory is very odd. It comes forth and states that every single religion has a part of the truth. Meaning what? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes and he sends down different religions by means of different prophets and every one of these prophets have a part of the truth. And if you were to combine all of the religions of the world and their main ideologies, then what do we come forth and we see? Then by this we come forth and we see that we have absolute truth. So in reality, again, they come forth and they say that we have to embrace the fact that we have all of these different theories and the fact that we have all of these different ideologies and the fact that we have all of these different viewpoints so this is number one what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala desired and this is what he wants for humanity. We come forth and we say that number one, again, it doesn't make very much sense. Why? We say number one, we come forth and we say that what would be the purpose for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to constantly send down prophet after prophet 
adding muscle to Salat to Islam, and each and every one of them come forth with only a part of the message. And every one of them have an equal part because God distributed truth, absolute truth, um, these sublime qualities equal. We state that this particular issue is a little bit problematic. They come forth and they say, no matter what path you take, eventually, after you pass away, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will place you on what is known as Salat and Mustafa. You can take any of these different paths. You can teach every one of them to have a part of the truth, and it's no problem. And they come forth and they present this ayah as evidence for this particular deed. Let us go ahead and take a look at it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the whole of Quran, verse 29, excuse me, chapter 29, sort of an Al-Kabut, verse 69. For those of you who are taking notes, mashallah, I see my baby. وَالَّذِينَ بِسْمَا رَحْمَةَ رَحِيمُ وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِيهَا لَنَعْذِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُلَنَا وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَمَعَ الْمُحْسِنِ But surely for those who strive in our way, we will guide them toward our paths. Our paths, not our path. They say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very clearly states that there are different paths and everyone who strives and everyone who desires and everyone who wants to become amongst those who are the followers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and who want to increase their knowledge about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are different ways and different means for them to get towards this absolute truth. All they have to do is make the effort, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, لَنَحْيَنَّهُمْ سُبُولَنَا They will take us towards these paths. How do we reconcile this particular verse? We state number one that the words trouble us comes from the singular word sabi. Sabi is different than the word sarat. This we come forth and we see that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states that those who work and strive in our way, we will lead them toward the different sabur. We state that these sabur, these means, these paths, are all a direction, are all an effort to guide us toward the absolute goal, which is a sarat and of course, we have several different narrations from the school of Ahlul Bayt, from those outside of the school of Ahlul Bayt, that state, As-Sarat al-Mustaqeen, who are wilaya ta'ali ibn Abi al-Talib, alayhi salatu wa sallam. But As-Sarat al-Mustaqeen, as we'll mention in a couple of moments, is one. And that Sarat, that path, is Ali ibn Abi al-Talib, that's the question. Then why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say that there are different pathways to Asarat and Mustafa? We come forth and we say that if you go and if you learn the religion from Imam al Mujtaba alayhi salatu wa salam, is it going to contradict from the teachings of Imam Amir al Mu'min? If you learn the religion from Abba Abdullah, they're going to take you away from the religion of Amir al Mu'min. If you learn the religion from Imam al Qad, they're going to take you away from if you learn the religion from Abu Sabr al Abbas, it's going to take you away from the Walai of Ali ibn Abu Bar al Asim. But these are the different ways, and these are the different means, and these are the different paths to take you to it, Ali ibn Abu Bar al Asim. This is point number two. Number two, we come forth and we say, look at the world. We say how many times? Ten days, ten times at least every single day in our Salat. If the Nasarat al Mustafa. Every single day we say, oh Allah, guide us toward As-Sarat al-Mustaq. The straight path. Not the straight path. Not the straight path. In fact, we go ahead and take a look at the language. In the Arabic language, when we present the word Aleph and Lam before something, it leads to what is known as Dari. For those of you who know the Arabic language, or those of you who have studied a little bit of Arabic grammar, then you will understand this particular point. Putting Aleph and Lam before something is specifying and concising exactly what we are trying to discuss. What do we state in the title? What do we state in the title? It's the Asrat As-Sarat Al-Mustaq. Number one, we state it's the Guide us, meaning guide everyone, guide humanity, us in the floor. And then we state As-Sarat Al-Mustaq. There's only one path. And of course, that path is the pathway 
and our wealth and our will have a desire for us to pay to get toward him. But the pathway that we have to take by the hand of God. Thus, this particular definition of pluralism, those that say that all religions have a part to do it also and reject this particular concept. Fourthly, we come toward a different definition. A definition that states that all religions, they have a plurality of interpretation. And I ask you to please bear with me for these next couple of points that I'm going to try to make. Please understand this point. The fourth definition comes forth in these individuals. They state that there is a plurality of interpretations in regards to religion. What is this? They say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has absolute truth. He, has, he is all knowledge. He is all merciful. He is omnipotent. And in the same definition that we describe, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They come forth and they state that the issue is that those who the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that those who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala selected as his prophet and as his representative on the earth, they interpreted the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala according to their own time and according to their own experience. Please understand this particular individual. It is very, very common. Commonly discussed in our community, unfortunately. They state that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends down the he sends down the same message that he sent down to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which is the same. Which was the same message that he sent down to Ibrahim, which the same message he sent to Musa, which was the same message message that he sent to Isa, which was the same message that was being um, uh, spoken about by the Imam Hadith. But every single representative, the hundred and twenty-four thousand prophets, and the twelve and the twelve imams of the other day, each and every one of them, they interpreted this religion on the basis of the circumstances in which they were Again, it sounds something extremely attractive. We pose the question in this number one. But how can you state that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down each and every one of these prophets and they interpret it their own way, then what would be the purpose of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stating to the people that these are my divine representatives? For instance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Holy Quran that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is known as Qasib al-Anbiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is the seal of the Prophet. He is the final Prophet. If he is the final Prophet, and then the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt, one by one, they come with a different interpretation of the religion of the last Prophet. Then aren't they all interpreting the religion of the final prophet differently than the way that the final prophet desired to interpret that religion. Aren't they all prophets as well? So if they contradict with one another, and if they have different viewpoints, it's only limited on the basis of their time of experience. Is this true? Number two. Number two, we come forth and we state that how dare one comes forth and says that the prophet, the commandment of the Ahlul Bayt, are limited by time and space. And that their words are only relative to a that period in which they live. We, we recited the verse a couple of days ago and I'll recite it again. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa ma yadu tahul anta hawa in huwa in la wahyun yun. Please understand this point. Oftentimes, when we recite this verse, we state that this verse means that every word of the Prophet is revelation, meaning it comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's it. But the second verse states, Wa ma yamtahu anil hawa in huwa in la wahyun yuhu. It says, and surely he, not the Lord, and surely he, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is the revelation himself. He himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the imams of the Ahlul Bayt, have this status that their words at every time and at every period and in every space are the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
this is what these individuals may come forth in this case. But we can accept a plurality of different interpretations because we come and we see that all of the prophets and all of the imams, they have their own interpretations when they spoke and when they preach the message. We say absolutely not. That their interpretation was the interpretation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That the interpretation of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he only spoke every single word and every single action and every single movement that he made and that the Adam faith made are exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala desired from them and from us. Let's be going to understand that this particular ideology of a plurality of interpretation when it comes to revelation is also rejected within the school of the Adam. Then we have a second definition, or a fifth definition, excuse me, a fifth definition of pluralism. These individuals, they come forth and they say that, oh, we don't state that there is a plurality of interpretation when it comes to revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no plurality of interpretation. We cannot accept contradicting ideology on the basis of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, on the basis of prophethood, on the basis of Quran on the basis of Imam, on the basis of the Ma'ad, and so on and so forth. But there is a plurality of interpretations in regards to knowledge which we are not searching on, or, or, or what are known as a room of them. For instance, that today we have a wide variety of different ulama and maraj. We have maraj and nafi, we have maraj and karma, we have maraj and karma. One will come forth and will state that when you go to a touch, and when you want to go and strike the Jamarat, you have to strike the Jamarat right in the middle of the Shaytan. The project's been expanded over the years and so on and so forth. This you should try to strike it in the middle. Others think, no, you, should, you can strike it anywhere. You can strike it on the right, you can strike it on the left, anywhere you want. This is a difference of opinion, a difference of interpretation of something which we are not certain about. We come forth again and say, for instance, another example. And one marja says that performing the jeer is makruh. Another one says that it is mustahab. Another one might say that it is haram. Another one might say that it is wash. But we are not certain about this particular conclusion. Thus, we see there's a difference of opinion, there's a plurality of interpretations in regards to this particular matter. We, the school of the Holy Quran, the Holy Quran, the teachings of the Holy Quran, we say that we accept this particular definition of the Quran. But if one comes and we're not certain about what are known as the Muriyatic deen, then it's okay to have a difference of opinion from the different Maraja. And if one follows this particular ayah, if one follows this particular fatwa, and I follow a different fatwa, does not mean that one of us are outside of the religion of Islam, or one of us are not following that which is the right path? Because they're all potential means to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and none of us are certain about that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala desires in the books of law, in all the Quran, or in the narrations of the other faith of the Tariq Muslim Salaam, the Salaam, the Salaam, the Salaam. So again, to recap very quickly, those individuals who come and they state that there might be a plurality of different viewpoints or ideologies when it comes to important parts of religion, foundational parts of religion, we say absolutely not. We say that no one can say, for example, within the school of Abu that Ali ibn Abu Talib is not the successor to the Prophet, that alcohol is not haram, that looking at a woman who you should not be looking at, you know, is something Muslim, no one will ever come forth, and state things like this. They can see they're all what are known as the Oriyatic themes, the necessities of religion. But in regards to aspects which are not, in regards to aspects which the marja, which the scholar has to perform what is known as an ishtihad, make an effort to derive the conclusion, we think there is no problem in accepting or accepting what is known as a plurality of different interpretations. And fifthly and finally, the last definition that is presented for pluralism, and of course there's many others, but the last for our discussion, is known as religious Perennialism. For those of you who have read many books in academia in regards to theology or religious studies, you will find that this particular aspect of perennialism is 
extremely dominant in theological circles and universities across the world today. Number one, because it's extremely attractive for the reader. And number two, because oftentimes it becomes the best academics. They come forth and they subscribe to it this view that it solves a lot of problems in, you know, the social sciences. Why? They come forth and they say, yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, now with the We say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like a cloud. You know in their words. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like a cloud. Or he manifests himself in a cloud. And within that cloud contains all the sublime qualities and names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This cloud comes over a region. And every raindrop that comes from this cloud is a different religion. Sounds very nice. Sounds very pretty. Sounds very attractive. But from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he desires the religion of Islam to come down as one manifestation of what he saw. Another one comes forth and say, uh, another raindrop comes, and it's the raindrop of Christianity. Another one is the raindrop of Judaism. Another one is the raindrop of Buddhism. Another is the raindrop of so on and so on. We come forth and we see that this particular theory, they desire to come forth and say that every single one of these religions, they hold fast toward absolute truth. And there's no need to discuss differences amongst these religions so they hinder our progress in society. This says, there's no need for you to debate. There's no need for you to discuss. There's no need for any of you to come forth and be in dialogue with one another. Why? Because these hinder our progress as a human being. Who says that if all of these forms of worship or all of these different ideologies and viewpoints are attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are equal, so why, for instance, did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala embrace the Islam? But he didn't want to submit to Adam. He didn't want to prostrate toward Adam. He's worshipped for thousands of years. Yet Shaitan refused to prostrate toward Adam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Why? Why? Did you fail to follow the instruction which Adam provided? But if he was following the religion for which he was coming to do that, that which is what him from in the words of today, more spiritually closer by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell On the day of Mubarakah, why did the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell those, so why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, so ta'ala wa 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 ta'
and anyone who desires to get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by means of that most perfect method, by taking the most pure route, it has to be by boarding the ship of the Ahmed Faith and Ahmed Faith. This is why the Hadith states that surely my Ahmed Faith is like a metal, Safina, no. But my Ahmed Faith, my family, are like the ship of Nuh. Those who board it, they are taken to the church. And those who don't take the ship, what happens? They drown. But once they say, no, wait a minute. But those guys who drown, they had a point. They might have had a point, not a point. The point is that there's one way to get towards success. There's one way to get toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of its most pure means, in terms of the most perfect path. And that's the path of Sarat al Mustaqim, wa al Sarat al Mustaqim, wa al Sarat al Mustaqim, wa al This begs the question. What is going to happen? It's a very common question, which is actually not part of this discussion. There are many people who have posed this question. They say that if the path of Ahmed Faith is that most pure and perfect path to get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how about the Ahmed? What happens to Ahmed? The man part of Jannah, he is down to hold so forth. He is an Islam of the living power. He is an Islam of the living power. The religion is not a deed of coercion. Rather, the religion of Islam is a very simple and simple question. Now, any one of us have this question entered into our mind, what is this person is going to come to the paradise, this person is not going to the paradise. Hold on for a second and say, if I get entered into paradise, I'm not worried about, you know, my neighbors or my friends or my teachers or my classmates. I'm worried about my own salvation. I don't know who is going to enter into paradise except if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guarantees that person paradise and the narration that they have been made are clear in regards to who they see. The Ahmed Faith they guarantee paradise. The enemies of the Ahmed Faith they guarantee paradise. I don't know anything else. I don't know anything else. We're not a religion which condemns us. We're not a religion that passes judgment on us. We leave the judgment up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He will determine who goes to paradise. He will, de- he will determine who goes there. Who receives punishment. The only thing that we need to worry about in terms of our lives, in terms of applying this discussion to our day to day, to our day to day life, is to understand that the pathway towards perfection is the pathway of Ahmed Faith. And the only individual that I need to worry about is myself. I need to strive to become the best individual that I can. I need to strive to become the one who gains my mind of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by walking in the footsteps of the Quran, of the Ahmed Faith. This is the important perspective that I have food with this particular narration. This narration that was recited so many times. This narration which the Arama have stated is on the highest level of what is known as Mutawakir. Inshallah, we'll discuss what is Mutawakir in another time. The highest level of authenticity in regards to Ahmed. Yet we find in this individual, who think this is what Ahmed Bey, they completely forego this in order to push forward their own action, uh, their own. Mahmoud al Abbas and Mahmoud, the order of Imam Ali ibn Musa Rabba, Ali Salatu was found to come from Medina toward Khorasan. On that journey, we know that he stops by a city known as Nisha Khoba. Imam Amir al Khorasan, Ali ibn Musa Rabba, Ali Salatu was found to come to that city, and the people of that city, they were amongst the Mawahi. They were amongst those who loved the Ahmed Bey. They went toward him and they said, Ya Ahmed Bey. Give us one piece of advice. According to some, there were thousands of people studying in Mecca. Thousands. Ulama, students, lovers of Ahmed Bey, ready to take some advice from the Imam of Bey. The Imam, Ali Salatu was found, he stands in the, name, in the highest point of that particular region, with thousands of people surrounding him. Thousands of people holding a notebook and a pen. Or, you know, the equivalent of whatever it was back then. They're ready to write down the advice and the words of the Imam. The Imam Ali Salatu was found. He stood in front of Jaffa and he was studying in Jaffa. And I've heard from my father who studied in Jaffa that he heard from his father in Jaffa ibn Muhammad. The initiation of his father, Muhammad ibn Ali, who heard from his father, Ali ibn Hussein, who heard from his father, Hassan ibn Ali. 
to be a Jesus father. I do not know that God will hurt from the house of Israel, God will hurt from the Israel, will hurt from the house of the Lord, 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 will hurt from the house of the
Another one says that Christ was one on the ground and he began to kiss the feet of the mom of the And he said, Oh, Abba, how can I watch you die? It's impossible. Please let me go and fight in your way. And he said that at this moment, the mom of the Hussein, Salam, he and Christ, they both fell unconscious on that day. The mom of the falls unconscious twice on the day of Ashura. One at this moment, and secondly, before Ali al Akbar leaves his attempt. And he said that the mom of Hussein, Ali Salam, he takes and he begins to prepare a Hassan. He goes toward the tent. He takes out the Imam. He takes out the Imam of Imam al Hassan. Alayhi salatu was salam. It is said that he takes half of the Imam of Imam al Hassan and he cuts it in half. He takes the half of the half, meaning a quarter, and he ties it on the head of Imam al Hassan. And he ties it on the head of the Hassan. Then he takes the other half of the half, the other quarter, and ties it around the waist of. But I ask you, oh, what I There was one half of the cloth of Imam al Hassan that remained. What was the purpose of it? The Hassan Imam al Hussein knew that he had to pick up the bodies of the Hassan after a couple of moments. But he said that at this moment, Imam al Hussein says, Hassan, go and send your last salutations toward your mother. Go and send your last salutations toward your aunt Zainab. And it's said that Qasim, alayhi salam, he enters into the tent of the women. At that moment, Lady Zainab stands up and says, As-salamu alayka, ya Allah, Muhammad, O my brother, have you returned to save us on this day? Qasim looks towards Zainab and says, Oh my Aunt Zainab, it is me, Qasim. She embraces him at that moment. He embraces his mother. Then he goes, and it is said that on the day of Ashura, every one of those companions, every one of the family members, they went out, they were getting prepared for battle, and they would come out and they would walk or they would ride their horses very valiantly. The person was just a young boy, 13 years old, 15 years old. He began to run on the battlefield, running to defend his uncle, Imam al Hussein, alayhi salatu wa salam. He began to recite his lines of poetry, Ibrahim bin Kiruni, Fa'an ibn al Hassan, Sibtun Nabi al Mustafa al Mu'taman, Wa Fa'an al Hussein, Kim Asir. I am the son of a man of Hassan. If you do not know me, and this is my uncle Hussein, you have made him into a prisoner. And he said, The first of those, he fights valiantly. He kills 35 of the enemy. All of a sudden, one of those, he looks to me to be a Muslim. And he says, May the sin of Allah have me. If I do not kill this guy with the beautiful face, he goes to a prison. Hassan, he looks down to fix his slipper. And he says, I'm 